Our first reading for the Advent season is right out of the Gospel of Luke in chapter 1, verses 67 through 80. This is known as the Song of Zechariah. His father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine down those living in the darkness and in shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace and the child grew and became strong in spirit and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel this is the word of the Lord and I pray, Lord, that you will bless to all of our hearts the message that has been given to me today by your Holy Spirit at work in all of us. We pray for your blessing upon your message to us. In Jesus' name, amen. And thus we begin the annual observance of the Advent season for the four Sundays before Christmas. The Advent season is a month for anticipating not just Christmas and Jesus' birthday, our Lord's first coming as a human baby, it is also a time to look forward to our Lord's second coming in glory. Even before the apostles finished writing to the churches, before all their letters were collected up into one book that we call the Bible, the church and the apostles believed that we, that they, and now we, we're living in the last days, the end times. They were already looking forward to Jesus' second coming before all of the first 12 apostles passed away. But our Lord has tarried, and we thank God that he did, or we would not be here to participate in that future glory. But as the Lord tarried, the church began to think about ways to keep track or keep count and also to stay alert so that we would not miss his second coming by forgetting that he said he would. The first mention of Advent is found in ancient writings dating back to the 6th century with some anecdotal mentions as early as the year 380 AD. Before that, the fledgling church was persecuted, underground, a family of believers who met in houses all over the Middle East and southwestern Europe. They were loosely connected, bound together by one faith, but loosely connected socially as missionaries like Paul continued to travel the lands from church to church, checking in on each local community and making sure they were keeping to the true faith. During the reign of the Roman Emperor Constantine the Great, from 306 to 337 AD, Christianity began to transition to the dominant religion of the Roman Empire. So as time passed, new traditions were born and established to help the congregations spread all over the Roman Empire to remember the gospel by retelling the stories of Jesus focused around his biography. Do you know that the calendar of the church follows the life of Christ from his birth at Christmas to his death and resurrection at Easter? Then from Easter to the next Advent season, the focus is on us, the work of the church. We tell and retell the ancient stories every year so that we remember and so that we look forward to the final consummation when Jesus comes again in the very last day. So now, let me take you back to the time of Zechariah. In fact, 
You become a citizen of a little village in Israel. You live outside of Jerusalem, not far from Bethlehem. You have heard of Zechariah and Elizabeth's miraculous pregnancy. Everybody's talking about the fact that Zechariah can't talk, that is. You've even gone to visit him just to see for yourself. You had expected him to be upset by the loss of his voice and maybe in depression, but he was surprisingly happy. He sat near his wife, who was also very happy, and she explained that they were happy because they were finally going to have their very own baby, and very soon now, as she patted her tummy. When that day came, the whole village turned out and crowded in and around the house for the day of circumcision. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. They were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, No, he is to be called John. They said to her, What? There's no one among your relatives who has that name. So they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, His name is John. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue set free and he began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. And Zechariah told them what the child would be. He sang the praises of God and proclaimed the mission of his son. You were there, listening to an old man's quavering voice raised in praise to God. You worshipped with him as you comprehended what he was singing about. Your own spirit soared with the hope that it was finally time for all of this to really happen. Could it be? Praise be to the Lord the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. He stopped to catch his breath. And you realize that Zechariah was speaking as if it had already happened. He was so confident in God's willingness to act on behalf of his people. But it had been so long since a prophet had spoken, nearly 400 years since anyone had spoken like this. Others around you broke out in praise to God, singing, Hallelujah, may it be so. And this went on for a while. A cacophony of mixed voices, all praising God in their own ways and words. It slowly quieted down, and in the lull, Zechariah began a second verse. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. You marveled at this message. This is a prophecy about the long-awaited Messiah. Zechariah was claiming that John would be the forerunner announcing the arrival of our great king. In the ancient world, a royal forerunner was charged with making the road ready for the king's arrival. He was sent ahead of the king's entourage so that everyone would know the king was coming and everyone would clean up the streets and prepare for a royal welcome. Would John grow up to do that for the coming Messiah? 
He couldn't do it as a baby. So that meant it might be another 15, maybe 20 or more years before the true king of Israel would arrive to restore the kingdom to good order. You wondered if you would live long enough to see it. And it was a bit discouraging to have to accept the idea that Messiah was still a long way off. But at least he was a lot closer now than ever. The announcement had been made. The king would be coming. That is, if Zechariah were really prophesying and not just excited about have, finally having a son after so many years and after everyone thought it was too late for this to be possible. But the birth was a miracle. So that was at least one reason to trust that God himself was up to something. There is a fact upon which to pin our hope. But how much longer must we wait? Can you feel it? The anticipation, the desire to be set free, the deep-seated awareness of everything that's wrong in the world, the overwhelming power of evil that controls your economy. In Zechariah's day, it was poverty enforced by overtaxation by evil King Herod allied with oppressive Rome. The only wealthy people seemed to be those who knew how to play the game, take advantage of the corruption, and didn't mind compromising their morals and ethics to benefit from Rome's control. But our time isn't very different now, is it? Just change a few names and the power dynamics are still the same. When is it ever going to stop? When will we finally have the peace we all long for so we can go about our business and build our own lives without interference from evil forces that try to take it away again? Even in our own hearts, when will we finally be fully set free from the sin that so easily besets us so that we can walk in righteousness? We thank God for the victories we have but we know the battle isn't over yet. We live in a time of great waiting. It's a lot like the time that Zechariah waited when the Jews were waiting for their Messiah to come. But there are also some significant differences. The Jews were waiting for a Jewish king to banish the Romans and restore local freedom to their own nation. We await the king of the world who has conquered death itself to come and banish Satan and evil from everywhere and restore spiritual freedom to everyone who believes this message. They were waiting for the forerunner to encourage the people to remove obstacles in the pathways and clear the roads of rocks and debris to make way for an earthly king. But John would really call sinners to remove obstacles of stubborn unbelief from their hearts and minds. And truly, those who had been baptized by John were more apt to believe and follow Jesus, especially after John welcomed Jesus onto the scene and pointed him out, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We are waiting for the victorious Lord who has taken away our sins for him to return in glory. They would have been fearful to announce the coming of a new king because Herod would do everything in his power to get rid of any competition. But we have been called and commissioned to announce the gospel of Jesus Christ without fear of death everywhere, every way we can. Paul put it this way in Ephesians 6. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. 
take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. That's the attitude and action in which we wait for the Lord's return. While we wait for the return of Jesus, we're not just hoping that an ancient story might be true. We know it's true. And the story isn't over until Jesus comes again. We are the current participants in Jesus' story. As we receive communion, we also receive Christ's commission again, renewed and refreshed in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And if you think God coming as a baby is a miracle, these days God comes to our world through you and me and our faithful service as disciples and ambassadors for Jesus. We are the body of Christ, the modern incarnation of God in the flesh. God is doing his work all over the world through people like you and me. Based on our faith in that, Jesus himself has commissioned us to play an active role in the story that is happening in our world today. Our hope is sure. Our future is glorious as promised for those who take up their crosses to serve the Lord by preaching the gospel every chance you get. We celebrate Christmas with great joy because it is the announcement of the beginning of the end of all evil. While we wait for the actual end, let us serve the Lord with great boldness. Preach the gospel. Love your neighbor. Wait for the Lord and keep watching for his coming. Encourage others to do the same. Go. Tell it on the mountain. Make every effort to reach the lost. Every day you can, every way you can, any way you can, in the power and strength of the Lord, through acts of love, loving kindness that speaks the truth and also cares for the suffering. Let us pray. Oh Lord, help our hearts to be ready to receive you, even now, and receive you again through the act of the Holy Communion. Let us be refreshed and renewed as we receive your body and blood. And let us be empowered by your Holy Spirit to proclaim the news, to sing the song of Zechariah, to shout it from the mountaintops that you are God and you save and you love. We ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.